QA engineer walks into a bar and they order a beer. They order zero beers. 9,999,999 beers. They order a rubber duck, negative one beers. A chocolate milk. Satisfied, they give the go-ahead for the bar to open. A week later, the first real customer walks into the bar and asks where the bathroom is. And the bar bursts into flames. As software developers, there is no end to the number and types of cases that we're asked to handle. And it can be difficult, if not impossible, to craft an app that accommodates all of these scenarios. Hi, everyone. My name is Nevin, and I'm a developer relations engineer on the Android DevRel team. In this talk, I'd like to talk through some tools and steps you can take in your media app to make sure that you're presenting a high quality experience for all your users. It goes without saying that media is ubiquitous in our lives nowadays. Whether you like to settle in for a cozy audiobook night, tune in to your favorite TV show after work, or just listen to music while folding the laundry, our media follows us everywhere. Users expect their media to be quickly and easily accessible from their phones and their watches, on their TVs, and in their cars. You might have to deal with low connectivity, or the device might have the latest and greatest specs for you to work with. And then there are behavior changes introduced with each Android release, and new features being introduced every year. Media is a rapidly evolving space, and it can be difficult to keep track of everything. You can abstract away tons of complexity by using a library that can handle this device and API fragmentation for you, and instead presents you with a single common API that works across all of these cases. For media apps, look no further than the Jetpack Media 3 library. Even compared to previous iterations of the media APIs, Media 3 offers a simplified API for you to use. For example, there's a single common uh, player interface that's used across many key components, such as media session and media controller, which makes it easier to follow exactly what's going on when you're trying to handle, say, a play command. Important information, such as the state of playback and the met metadata of the currently playing media item, are automatically kept up to date so that all of your clients remain in sync. Media 3 is also where we're introducing new capabilities, such as the ability to specify which playback commands are available to media controllers on an individual basis. In addition, we're expanding beyond playback use cases with a new module called Transformer for video editing and transcoding use cases. But perhaps as you consider Media 3 for a current or upcoming project, what's more important to you is what's staying the same. Media 3 is fully backwards compatible with legacy APIs such as Media Compat so that all of your existing integrations will continue to work. Media 3 also retains the customizability and modularity that uh, developers enjoy with projects such as ExoPlayer, which itself is now a module within Media 3. And if nothing else, Media 3 is the new home for future development of the media APIs and is where our efforts are invested going forward. Let's take a closer look at a couple key components in Media 3. ExoPlayer is Media 3's default implementation of the Player API. Note that if you already use the standalone ExoPlayer, Media 3 ExoPlayer is identical and just requires a package name change if you're using a recent release. ExoPlayer offers out-of-the-box support for traditional player functionality, such as playing, pausing, and skipping media items, but it also includes APIs for features like playlists, ad insertion, adaptive streaming, and DRM. You can check out our previous talks discussing Media 3 for a more detailed introduction to the library. But for now, I'd like to demonstrate how you can use Media 3 with your own custom player if you choose to do so. Media 3 offers a simple base player that minimizes the number of methods you need to implement to integrate with a custom player. Start by overriding the getState method, which is where you can declare what commands are supported by your player and configure some metadata, such as the currently playing media item index and the timestamp uh, that you're currently at. Any methods related to commands that you don't declare as supported will be ignored. So beyond the getState method, you'll only need to implement the methods that will actually get used. 
Subclassing the simple base player also grants you some additional conveniences, such as state value validation and listener handling already being set up. Once you have a player, you can implement a media session. Media session is a key API for cross-surface consistency across Android, as it allows you to broadcast playback information to the entire system and also receive playback requests from other clients, which may include headphone or remote controls, uh, system-drawn playback controls, or the Google Assistant. Media session is technically optional, though without a proper implementation, your user's experience is likely to be degraded. They may not be able to easily access their media through Android Auto while on a drive, or they may not be able to control their songs while out on a run from their watch. To this effect, we recommend structuring your project in Android Studio so that you can reuse your Media 3 code as much as possible, instead of trying to manually re-implement the media session the same way every time. By compartmentalizing common components, such as your player and media session in a separate module, you can reuse your implementation across all the surfaces you support. Code once and build twice. Next, I'd like to talk about Performance Class, a tool that you can use to make sure you're presenting the best experience to each user on a device-by-device -device basis. There are billions of Android devices out in the wild, with varying hardware specs, capabilities, and software implementations. So how can you be certain that your app will perform well no matter what? Rather than scaling down app experiences for the whole ecosystem to accommodate lower-end devices, one option is to define groups of devices that perform similarly. This way, for example, you could specify that your app does full resolution playback on high-performing devices, but reduce the resolution on lower performing devices to make sure that the playback stays smooth. Another area where device clustering can help is to focus your debugging efforts on the groups of devices that are most affected. For example, let's say you notice that an issue mostly happens on mid-tier devices, but doesn't seem to affect the low-end or high-end market. You can refocus your testing efforts on those devices specifically, saving you time and effort. For each version of Android, starting with Android 12, the Compatibility Definition Document, or CDD, defines the performance class as a set of optional additional requirements. These requirements are verified by the certification test suite so that each device build is assigned a performance class level if it passes the corresponding criteria. Requirements include a number of items that media apps would be interested in, such as screen resolution and density, codec support, and startup latency. The recommended way to access a device's performance class level is with the Jetpack Core Performance Library. This library extends performance class back to Android 11 and also assigns performance class to devices that don't declare their own based on certification test results. Note that the library is currently in alpha, but we look forward to releasing the beta version soon and encourage you to try it out. In this example, we start by first creating an instance of device performance in the onCreate method. Then, we can use the device's performance class level to adjust the video encoding resolution, using a higher encoding height for devices with higher performance level. Even if you don't use performance class to turn features on and off in your app, performance class can be an additional helpful signal to include in your telemetry to better understand how your app is performing based on different device characteristics especially as you look to optimize your app for newly launched devices in the market. Now, at this point, I've shared a number of strategies to help you ensure that for one user on one device, they can thoroughly enjoy their media no matter what the scenario is. Let's take a slight pivot to look at the content generation side of things and discuss how to make sure your content remains high quality as it travels from device to device. There are, of course, multiple factors that can impact visual quality. OEMs define the camera features and other specs available on a device. The SOC affects encoder efficiency and reliability. Android platform offers APIs and tools for you to use, and it all converges on you, the app developer, who decides what your media pipeline looks like. Optimizing when and how your media is processed can have an immediate and noticeable quality impact so that your content remains crisp. 
The typical media sharing pipeline can be split into four broad steps. We start by capturing some media. This is where the image, video, or audio is initially encoded, and the goal here is just to capture the best quality we can. Next, there might be some editing involved. You might layer elements on top of your content, such as adding filters, captions, or effects, or you may be transforming the media by cropping or scaling. Ultimately, throughout all of these edits, the main thing we want to do is preserve as much of the original quality as possible. After this, the content is likely to be uploaded somewhere. This is the step where you can perform further transcoding to try and optimize the content for multiple consumer devices. And lastly, the content is downloaded to a device for playback, ideally with minimal touch-ups required on the receiving end. Let's take a closer look at the middle two steps in this process, editing and uploading. When it comes to editing, optimizing the order of operations can help you preserve quality in the areas where it most matters. For example, Let's say you're recording in the standard rectangular aspect ratio, but you really only care about the square in the middle. By cropping the content to a square before doing any further encoding or editing, you'll avoid wasting resources on the portions of the video, of the video that don't matter. Another common transformation is to scale the content up or down. Scaling almost always degrades quality significantly, so ideally you should be recording at the target resolution to begin with. At the very least, aim to keep resolution changes to at most one operation in the entire pipeline, and make sure to use efficient algorithms such as bicubic scaling. For the upload step, you can retain quality by making sure you're compressing the content as efficiently as possible. On Android 10 and up, you should include B-frames in your uploads to improve compression efficiency and video quality. Similarly, Aim to use newer codecs whenever and wherever possible to get files that store higher quality content in fewer bits. In addition, use the highest profile possible provided by the codec to take advantage of features such as B-frames. We're investing in supporting modern codecs, both by including and improving software codecs in the platform, and in the longer term by working with device manufacturers to include hardware-based codecs. New format requirements are part of the CDD and generally announced via an Android developer blog post so that you can stay up to date. Especially if you ingest or consume content from shared storage, make sure you have a way to decode new formats. Formats that can be used for capture by the native camera app are a great place to start. It goes without saying that new codecs and formats are introduced because they are better in some way. So we encourage early decoder adoption. And it doesn't need to be an all or nothing decision. You can gradually add support by starting with lower resolutions or by rolling out support to a subset of devices. The Media3 Transformer library I mentioned earlier can be helpful when making sure your app is able to co handle content in new formats. For example, in cases where you ingest content from external sources. Let's start by taking a look at a simple example of how to use Transformer. First, specify the output type you want. Then, build a transformer, passing it the request and a listener. The transformation happens asynchronously on a background thread, so the listener has callbacks for completion and error cases. And lastly, start the transformation. Finally, I'd like to briefly touch on some of the premium features that Android has added more support for recently that you can integrate with to take your app to the next level. Android 13 introduced standardized platform support for HDR, including APIs for capture, sharing, editing, and playback. For playback of HDR video, you can use display.getHDR capabilities to check which HDR profiles the device supports. To play HDR video, you'll need to render your content to a surface view. Texture view will only display video in SDR. ExoPlayer is the recommended way to play HDR video, since its default UI components already use surface view. For any use cases where you need to convert HDR video to SDR, you can use Transformer by enabling the SDR tone mapping flag when building the transformation request. 
This will currently work on devices that support HDR capture, but we're working on extending this functionality to devices that don't support HDR capture as well. Alternatively, the Transformer API currently includes an experimental API for editing HDR video streams directly. With this flag enabled, Transformer will attempt to edit HDR streams as HDR. This feature is currently under development, and we're looking for your feedback, so please try it out and let us know if you run into any issues. For more on implementing HDR video from end to end, check out Ray's talk on HDR video. And lastly, spatial audio, which refers to a technology that creates a sound field surrounding the user. This allows them to hear differences in audio channels and sound positions through just the two speakers of a headset. Advantages of spatial audio include more immersion and realism, clearer dialogue, and a better listening comfort. In Android 13, we introduce standardized platform architecture that enables lower latency and codec agnostic spatialization of multi-channel audio. For developers, we have the Spatializer API to help you check the current device's capability to output spatialized audio. Here, we're checking for four criteria. First, does the device support spatialization to begin with? Next, is spatialization currently available on the device? Then, is spatialization even enabled? This is controlled by the user through a system level setting. And lastly, is the currently playing audio track eligible for spatialization? This can be affected, for example, by the, whether the audio is being routed through a supported output device. If you use ExaPlayer, this logic is already handled under the hood in the latest release. The player will automatically select the appropriate audio track from your file based on the device's capabilities. Hopefully I've shared at least one tip that will help you improve the quality of your app, and I look forward to seeing the delightful experiences that you continue to build. Thanks for your time.